Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, questions for the Prime Minister about Ottawa's pandemic response. On closing the border earlier. We could have if we had done it unilaterally. On getting enough PPE. We came pretty close in terms of uh, running out. And on Canadians now worried about repaying the CERB. We're going to work with them. Rosemary goes one-on-one -on -one with Justin Trudeau. Then, at issue, has its take. Also tonight, tough questions for private long-term care homes. Why don't you put some of your profits into renovating your facilities? What the numbers reveal. Plus, pregnancy and the COVID vaccine. Yeah, there's just so many questions, you know? We'll sort through the latest thinking. This is The National. Well, tonight across Canada, just over 7,000 new cases of COVID-19. That's another new record in a year that has been full of them. Today, the Prime Minister sat down with our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton, to take stock of all that's happened in 2020 and how his government has managed the pandemic. You're going to see lots of their conversation tonight, starting with the issue that's made hundreds of thousands of Canadians anxious about their finances. They've received letters warning that they may have to return thousands of dollars in CERB payments. Catherine Cullen shows us what Justin Trudeau told Rosie to try and ease their fears and why it may not work. Don't want people to worry over Christmas. This the Prime Minister is trying to offer reassurances to people like Jack Newfeld and his wife. Helping our, 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 our families and, and grandchildren and, and, and so on, uh, things that we've been assisting with financially, um, have had to stop. He lost his job in April. Her CERB was helping them get by. Now they're taking a loan to repay the benefits. So we're basically looking at, I believe, um, just under $19,000. The CRA has written to 441,000 Canadians to say they might have to pay back their CERB. For many self-employed, it comes down to one line in the application. You earned a minimum of $5,000 before taxes in the last 12 months or in 2019. Many complain it wasn't clear how that income would be calculated, and they're only being told now they weren't entitled to the benefits. The message that I'm giving to Canadians is, if that letter is causing you anxiety, don't worry about it. You, you don't have to repay that before during Christmas. You don't have to think about January 1st as any deadline. And we're going to work uh, over the coming weeks and months uh, to make sure that there's a path forward that makes sense. But when it comes to whether that includes financial relief, would the government consider forgiving uh, those repayments or setting up a payment plan? Like, what are you actually everyone's, suggesting? Everyone's in different situations. Yeah. Uh, we're going to work with people. We're going to look at what the options are, but I don't want people to worry okay. uh, about repaying So forgiveness is a seasons. possibility for, for there's some a, There's people. a range of things we're going to look at. Well, my take on that is that it's a pretty political answer. It doesn't change the way I feel at all. I mean, I, I, I still, you know, worry. He says the Prime Minister's words won't solve his family's problems. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. And Rosie will be back with the At Issue panel later in the program. You'll also see more of her interview with the Prime Minister. Should the government have acted more quickly? And what was it like to work with Donald Trump when they had to close the border? Okay, let's turn to the situation in long-term care homes. Ontario says it'll add billions in funding in support of thousands of jobs. Now, more COVID deaths by far have happened in those homes than anywhere else. But it's a situation even worse in homes run by private chains. David Common brings us exclusive details on which ones. COVID is surging again in Ontario care homes, and once inside, it has killed an average of 3.7 people per 100 residents in the mix of homes. But zoom in on just the four profits, that rate jumps to 5.2. And some chains fared far worse. Rica at 8.6 deaths, Southbridge at 9. Lisa Levin represents the better off not for profit sector, which has quietly touted its differences for years. Things like lower mortality rates, um, less falls, less use of antipsychotic medication. For-profit Southbridge did not respond to requests for comment on the weeks-long statistician-reviewed CBC analysis. Rika, which owns this home, did, calling it flawed and not an accurate reflection and blamed outbreaks early in the pandemic before COVID was better understood. Like many of the for-profit chains, it also pointed to community spread and a greater prevalence of older building design, 
where residents are packed closer together is the main factors. Indeed, 22 years ago, the government banned construction of three- and four-person rooms, in part for infection control, but grandfathered in the hundreds already built, mostly, as this elder care expert says, in for-profit homes. You could rightly ask, well, why don't you put some of your profits into renovating your facilities? Uh, so I think that it hasn't been a priority for uh, those homes. Many homes have asked the province for more money to upgrade, while some nonprofits have fundraised or set aside cash each year. It, it goes into taking care of the seniors, and it doesn't go to shareholders or, or profits. So David, has the Ontario government acknowledged the higher death rate in for-profit homes? Well, the provincial government's top scientific advisors certainly have, calling it just earlier this week a risk factor when it comes to both outbreak size and deaths. And families are noticing too. Now, the for-profit chain with the highest death count is right now trying to buy this Toronto care home, and 26,000 people have signed a petition asking the province to stop it. Hmm. Interesting. David Common, thank you so much. Thank you. Now staying in Ontario, hospitals in the province are calling for a 28-day lockdown in regions under the red zone. It comes on yet another record-setting day, more than 2,400 new cases. It's the third straight day Ontario has exceeded that 2,000 case mark. You see a trend, and the trend continues to, to grow. And so it's very, very concerning, the situation we're facing right now. The Premier has said all options are on the table, but didn't provide any further details. Now, hospital workers know better than anyone what spiking case numbers can lead to. And today, one doctor spoke some cold, hard truth about what he has seen COVID do. Most people don't have a mental model of what dying from COVID looks like. They know what dying of cancer or heart attack looks like. Let me paint a picture. So uh, you're in a room, perhaps with a nurse, hopefully with a nurse holding your hand. You might be lying on your belly because that's the only way that you can breathe. Um, if we have time to get the iPad ready, we organize a Zoom call with your family. They're crying on the Zoom call as you take your last breath. And you're alone. You're not with, you're with us, but you're not with the people who know you. If this is pulling an emotional string in someone watching and it, and tell, it keeps them home this weekend and home over Christmas, then I've done my job because this is real. And uh, I, we can't have it continue. Too many people are getting hurt. Pretty devastating description there. Uh, it has been, meanwhile, another devastating day in Alberta. This is the highest figure that I have had the sad task of reporting. More than 1,500 cases with a record 30 deaths. The province also announced expanded rapid testing in care homes, rural hospitals and urban homeless shelters starting tomorrow. Well, Big White Ski Resort near Kelowna is cancelling all non-local reservations after a COVID outbreak this week. Dozens of people have now tested positive at the resort despite COVID protocols and fewer visitors. As Greg Rasmussen shows us, the outbreak illustrates that fine line ski operators and local politicians are walking between COVID safety and business survival. You. At every turn, Canada's biggest ski resort is dramatically different. The normal bustling village is quiet and getting up the mountain requires a reservation. He's a single rider, so he will get into a gondola all on his own. There is an official government advisory saying don't travel to Whistler, but the resort doesn't police where people are from. It's not something that we can control. What we can control is the safety protocols that we have in place being open. In the BC interior, Big White Ski Resort is dealing with 60 COVID cases confirmed this week, mostly in workers who live in shared housing. On the hill, worry. We're seasoned pass holders, so we want to be here as often as we can. You can hope they get uh, under control. Late today, the resort announced anyone booked to stay between now and January 8th will have their reservations cancelled unless they live in the local area. Tourism operators are left walking a fine line, noting the travel advisory doesn't make it illegal to visit. Whistler's mayor declined to directly tell people to stay away. We're asking people to take very seriously the direction that Dr. Henry is providing. With restaurants and pubs sitting mostly empty, this brew pub is switched to selling canned beer rather than pints at the bar. 
That's the majority of our business now. Is a few out-of-towners are still stopping in for a beer. But now we mainly just see people from Vancouver that are coming up. So, you know, it's a catch-22. We're happy to see them, but at the same time, we don't really want them to. So, On the hill, a smattering of out-of-province license plates with many locals saying there's a plus to fewer visitors. It is nice to have the mountain to ourselves as locals. Make pretty turn, make pretty turn. Not so good for local hotels, which predict a 45% drop in business compared to last year. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Whistler. Well, the person heading up the country's vaccine rollout has confirmed to CBC News that Canada may have more doses of the Pfizer vaccine than first thought. The way it works is that there's actually overage in every vial. If you're very careful, uh, you could actually have enough for a little bit over a sixth dose. So an interesting bit of information there. And he said that that has been communicated to the provinces and territories. It looks like we have a favorable vote. An independent U.S. panel, meanwhile, has endorsed emergency use of Moderna's vaccine. It's on track to be the second vaccine approved in the country. The FDA is expected to grant special authorization within days. Now, COVID-19 vaccines are not recommended for pregnant women, at least not at this point. But some pregnant frontline health care workers are being given the option to get the shot. So with more on the risks and recommendations, Christine Burak takes a closer look. Canadian doctor Sarah Lai is a pediatric surgeon in the United States. Lai wants the vaccine to protect her and her patients, but she's also seven months pregnant, and these shots weren't tested on pregnant people. I don't know if it's safe for me to have this vaccine. I don't know if it will be safe when I start breastfeeding um, to have the vaccine. Currently, the UK is advising those who are pregnant should not have Pfizer's vaccine. The US and Canada aren't recommending it either, but add vaccines could be offered to essential workers, for example, if a risk assessment finds the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the potential risks. That may mean to take the vaccine. That may mean to pass on the vaccine. Doctors say vaccines that use dead pieces of viruses can safely be given during pregnancy. New mRNA vaccines don't use the virus itself. They offer a short-lived set of genetic instructions to build that outer spike to alert the immune system. There's nothing so far that would lead us to say that this is a big risk. Typically, pregnant people are not included in the first round of vaccine trials, but a small number of participants in the Pfizer trial did become pregnant. Doctors say they haven't seen any serious side effects. But those people have not delivered their babies yet, so we don't know what happened with their fetuses yet. But so far, nothing that would be worrisome. A recent American study suggests the absolute risks of COVID-19 during pregnancy are low, but pregnant women were at significantly higher risk for severe outcomes compared with non-pregnant women. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's appropriate in a situation like this to have a blanket across the board recommendation either to do it or not to do it. But now it's just, there's just so many questions, you know. Lai says she's waiting for more data, but may get the vaccine after her baby is born in March. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, to other news now. A winter storm has hit parts of the U.S. East Coast. I'm telling you it is not safe and you shouldn't be out there. At least four people were killed, and at major airports, dozens of flights were cancelled. The same system hit Atlantic Canada today. It is expected to move out to sea by tomorrow. A powerful cyclone has killed at least two people in Fiji. The storm hit the country overnight with hurricane-force winds. Dozens of houses were destroyed. Well, after a nearly two-year ban, the Boeing 737 MAX is one step closer to flying Canadian skies again. Those jets were grounded after two major crashes killed hundreds of people. Now, Boeing has made changes and Transport Canada has approved them, but for some, it's not enough. Ashley Burke tells us more. This is a Boeing 737 MAX making a test flight in Ottawa this month. There are no passengers on board, but in the new year, that could change. We feel very confident that uh, we have done our homework properly. The government spent nearly two years working with other regulators around the world to ensure the MAX was fixed. Now Canada has independently verified a series of changes. This plane has been looked at very, very carefully because we want to make sure that we absolutely fix it. Countries worldwide grounded the plane after two deadly crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. 
In both cases, investigations found software flaws had forced the plane down after getting faulty data from a sensor. I don't think it should fly again. There's a lot of grandfathered hazards that are still on this plane. Chris Moore's 24-year-old daughter, Danielle, was on board the Ethiopian Airlines flight on her way to a UN assembly in Kenya. To think about, you know, what I've, I'll be missing in the future, um, you know, going on, on trips with her, uh, perhaps seeing her, her offspring and, you know, uh, being a grandfather, uh, that's been taken away from me. And I found what I think is a serious flaw. This flight control flaw system that, expert says the plane that, shouldn't fly sure yet. Jill Primo told Transport Canada that even with fixes to the plane's software, if a bird hit a sensor, the plane could still get faulty information. And it could cause the airplane to stall, which means the airplane falls like a rock out of the sky. Transport Canada says it has looked into Primo's concerns and is satisfied that the combination of design changes along with training will mitigate any risks. The government still has to give the plane the green light. That's expected to happen in the new year. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, turning to Edmonton, where the Hate Crimes Unit has joined the police investigation into a pair of racially motivated attacks, both against black Muslim women wearing headscarves, both at the same location, just a week apart. Rafi Bujikanyan explains. I get in my car and I've actually realized that I always lock my doors. Brahma Mohammed thinks a lot about staying safe. Sometimes it's hard for me to say if I'm walking into a space, if I'm getting stares because I'm black or because I'm Muslim or because I'm woman, or is it all of those things that are triggering the person? Her fear all the more tangible now. Tuesday, Edmonton police arrested a 32-year-old woman and charged her with the assault of a black woman wearing a hijab on a transit platform. A week earlier, police arrested a 41-year-old man after he attacked two black women wearing hijabs as they were sitting in their car in a shopping mall parking lot. It is heartbreaking because it is not my idea of Canada and it is definitely not my idea of, of Edmonton, um, uh, but, but that hatred does uh, linger and fester uh, in, in all communities. In the 10 years between 2009 and 2018, according to Statistics Canada, there were 127 police reported hate crimes directed at Muslims in Alberta. And the trend is rising. Almost 50 were in the final two years. But community members say so much more goes unreported. Um, some are, are not wanting to, uh, for people to um, know publicly who they are. Some are worried about, um, you know, retaliatory um, actions that can take place. Edmonton police have taken the rare step of recommending increased sentencing in both recent cases based on what they call hate-related motivations. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Well, when we come back, the Prime Minister tells our chief political correspondent how he experienced those early moments of the pandemic. Not know how it was going to end, when it was going to end, what would happen next. What was that like? There was no rule book for Prime Ministers on doing this. From securing PPE to closing the border, what he would do differently now. Plus, at issue is here to break it all down. And what if I just threw this thing together real quick, drive around and blast some music gives the word joy ride a whole new meaning we're back in two minutes We will soon say goodbye and good riddance to 2020, the crazy year that no one saw coming and that tested the resolve of every Canadian. Now to talk about all of it, what we've been through and where we're going, the Prime Minister sat down with our chief political correspondent, Rosie Barton, and you'll be able to catch much more of their exchange this Sunday on Rosemary Barton Live. But right now, we're gonna show you what the Prime Minister told her about the very earliest responses to COVID-19. To set this up for you, Rosie started by asking about the Global Public Health Intelligence Network. That's a Canadian initiative designed to alert the government to health threats like the coronavirus. But it's now under review because some critics say it doesn't work like it should. The Global Public Health Intelligence Network was uh, something that was fairly critical to flagging SARS early on and H1N1 early on. I know there's a review of it right ha happening right now. But clearly moving the, the goal of that 
organization away from flagging pandemics be has become an issue. Do you think if it was doing its job properly, you would have had a better early warning sign? I think we, we used all the resources that we always have to follow and monitor. I don't know that it would have made a huge difference uh, for us to have extra reporting on top of what we were getting. Mm -hmm. There were really concerning reports from far away and we started to, to take measures, but as we look back, uh, there's lots of things that uh, we probably would have wanted to have done, uh, done sooner in terms of preparing. Like what? Well, I think uh, the, the next time any, any leader sees reports of a possible, uh, possible flu-like virus uh, coming uh, out of, of, of some corner of the world, uh, make sure we have the right stockpiles of PPE and start ordering more. Uh, that was one of those things as I look back. I mean, we were all scrambling around the world in, in March and April to try and get enough PPE. We heard terrible stories of uh, people having to uh, bring home and wash uh, their, their PPE, their masks uh, after a long shift at the hospital. Um, we got to a good place. We came pretty close in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, running out, but we didn't have any big disasters on that. Um, we got Canadians to, to start manufacturing them. We got more in. Now we're fine, yeah. but there was a scramble there. We didn't want to repeat. I wouldn't want to have to repeat. You closed the U.S.-Canada border to non-essential travel. It was on March 21st. Why was there reluctance to do that up until that point? Why did you wait until then? Well, we actually only waited a couple of days uh, after we closed the international borders to close the U.S. borders. Yeah, but you could have closed and the, the U.S. border at the same time. You could have closed all the borders sooner. We could have if we'd done it unilaterally, but I made the decision that we would take two days to coordinate with the United States to ensure that the essential flow of goods and services from pharmaceuticals to food uh, continued to go across the border. And uh, what we've seen since then is uh, an uninterrupted, uh, almost the same as before, level of trade between our two countries. Yeah, but it, but it does seem as though there were some early cases from China and from Iran, but the vast majority of cases uh, that came into Canada were from Europe and the United States. Yes. So should that have happened earlier? But the vast majority of those cases were Canadians returning from United States and, uh, and, and Europe. And you can't close border. You don't close the border to Canadians no. coming home. So the, that border closure wouldn't have made a huge difference. We felt that taking those two days to ensure the continued smooth flow of trade and a good working relationship with the United States was important. Dr. Tam told me when I interviewed her that she had never even contemplated that the border could be shut down between Canada and the U.S. Is it fair to say that that never crossed your mind either, that it was something that seemed sort of you know, out of the realm of possibility at first? It wasn't something that we thought about until it became obvious that it was something that we needed to do. And I think one of the reasons was we saw a, a beginning of, of trajectories going in different directions. Uh, we knew that it would be really important to be able to, to control and protect Canadians as best as we could. Um, the, the United States was feeling very much the same. They'd already brought in a few extra border closures. So uh, we worked very closely with them. I remember it was on a, a, a call with the G7 that I said, uh, we're gonna be closing our borders later today. And then I turned to Donald Trump and I said, uh, but we're going to talk, you and I, uh, over the coming days about making sure that it's something because we're not closing our borders to you yet. Let's coordinate on that. Over the past few days, I've spoken to President Trump about what we can do to slow the spread of COVID-19. We have agreed that both Canada and the United States will temporarily restrict all non-essential travel. I spoke with the Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, very uh, good relationship, obviously, between us and our two countries. It won't affect trade at all. And uh, it was just something we thought would be good for both countries. And that was both appreciated by him and understood by everyone. And it, it led to a, a smoothness that I think uh, has, uh, has benefited Canadians today. Over about those two weeks in March there, where things sort of started to get pretty, you know, incredible, you and the premiers made a decision to start shutting down parts of the country. What did that feel like at the time as, as a prime minister to know you were doing this and not know how it was going to end, when it was going to end, what would happen next? What was that like? Well, it was, it was a, a question of having faith in our experts. I mean, we, there was no rule book for prime ministers on doing this. Uh, we 
relied on epidemiologists and scientists and researchers and doctors to say, to say you know what, the best thing to do uh, is uh, to move towards a shutdown. And therefore, we followed the advice of the experts, but at the same time as a government, we kicked into high gear with the decision we made around that time that we would be there for Canadians, that we would have people's backs. So while that happened, as the premiers and us, we all told people to stay home and, and, and not, uh, uh, not go out. Um, we were working as quickly as we could to get, uh, get help out to Canadians. Okay, so Rosie, that's just part of what you covered with the Prime Minister, but give us more. Tell us what we can expect on Sunday on Rosemary Barton Live. We're going to talk about some of the things the government has to do next, Andrew, digging our way out in, of this into an economic recovery of some kind. We'll go back and look at the WE controversy uh, to talk to the Prime Minister about that. And also uh, an election. Is it out of the realm of possibility? I would say not so much. Mm, okay, and that issue is next. What do you guys have planned? Uh, as you just heard Justin Trudeau say there, there were there measures he could have been better prepared for. Is there a risk to saying that, to making that sort of admission? The gang's got a lot to say about that. It's coming up right after this. I think uh, the, the next time any, any leader sees reports of a possible, uh, possible flu-like virus uh, coming uh, out of, of, of some corner of the world, uh, make sure we have the right stockpiles of PPE, start ordering more. We're fine, but there was a scramble there we didn't want to repeat, I wouldn't want to have to repeat. The Prime Minister, looking back on what could have been a very different start to the pandemic, a lesson for him 10 months into the crisis, and one we talked about during our year-end interview earlier today. So what are the political risks or benefits of admitting your mistakes? How is the Prime Minister applying those lessons now? Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. I'll, I'll start with you, Chantal, maybe just on, on the answer there and the the admission that, well, here's something that we, we actually didn't do well, uh, that probably the whole world didn't do particularly well, but we've now course corrected you would not want uh, your prime minister in the face of evidence that the, he and the whole world didn't do something well to be arguing to canadians that everything was perfect mm. if there is one thing about the management of this pandemic that we've seen is that it is that uh, governments were up to a point in the early stages, making it up as they went along. Yeah. Uh, and up to a point also in some form of denial over the reality of this. I don't think that the Canadian government is unique on this, and I certainly don't think that the Liberal Party was unique uh, in, in this in the House of Commons. It, it, it's sort of a risk-free thing to admit, it seems to me, Andrew, right? Because it's something that they corrected and, and now they're using as a lesson forward. Maybe I'm reading that wrong, but. You generally look good when you confess your errors. Um, in this case, I think it's a little bit cagey, though, in that it's the, the tone of it suggests, and we've been discussing, well, everybody was caught flat-footed the same way. In hindsight, yes, we could have done X, Y, or Z better. But remember, we have less excuse than most. We had one of the worst outbreaks of SARS in 2003. Uh, we are also hit, hit by the H1N1 uh, swine flu. We had s detailed reports that came out of those experiences. Mm -hmm. the, the Ontario Commission of Inquiry, the Federal Commission led by Dr. David Naylor, the 2006 Preparedness Panel Report uh, that laid out a playbook for how to deal with future pandemics, including stockpiling protective equipment, for example, none of which seems to have been followed. So along with all the other uh, uh, inquiries, I think one of the things we want to look into after this is why those reports and those recommendations weren't followed. We had advice before, and it's not just all hindsight. Yeah, it's curious because in another interview, uh, the Prime Minister did say, we went back to those books and we started looking at those reports and, and figuring out what we needed to do. But, uh, you know, it was almost too late at that point to look at those things. All that work should have been done ahead of time, Althea. Yeah, well, we do have a national stockpile. It's just that they discovered, as the Prime Minister, I think, was referring to his in, in his interview, was that the it was filled with expired N95 masks and uh, gloves. And so they had to, uh, well, they had actually gotten rid of it, and then they had to buy new things. Um, I think it is, we have learned, I think, that politicians, if they say, I'm sorry, I recognize that I made a mistake and we're going to do better, uh, the public can be very forgiving of that. But he's also admitting to a mistake that we all know about, yeah. that it's public. It's much more risky to admit something that we don't know about. And he hasn't done that yet. 
So I think until he does that, right now yeah. it's good politics, but it's not, I mean, we can't really commend him for being, yeah. uh, for taking a risk here. Yeah, it's also, it, it, I mean, it is hard at this stage to do a post-mortem because we're, we're sort of still in the thick of it. Um, anyway, and I, we did look back at a few things. And another topic I talked about was the closure of the Canada-U.S. border. Again, something that many people said, well, that should have happened much sooner. Here's what a sum of what he said about what was happening behind the scenes in March. It was on a, a, a call with the G7 that I said, uh, we're going to be closing our borders later today. I think it was a Monday. We're going to be closing our borders later today. And then I turned to Donald Trump and I said, uh, but we're going to talk, you and I, uh, over the coming days about making sure that it's something because we're not closing our borders to you yet. Let's coordinate on that. I mean, he, he said that he very, he said very clearly he didn't want to have to do that unilaterally, that he, he wanted to do it with the United States as opposed to just alone. Um, what did you make of that, Chantal? What does that tell you about how that got managed? If you're going to close the Canada-U.S. border, which is not like closing the border to people coming from the EU, you do want it to happen in an orderly fashion. If you're dealing with Donald Trump and his White House, you do want to make sure that you can get somewhere on the same page. And then there is something to be said, and I say this from living in Montreal, where the March break happened just before yeah, that's right. uh, all hell broke loose. It, it, there is a point to be made for the fact that it was Canadians coming back from wherever uh, that brought uh, COVID-19 and not the fact that uh, suddenly visitors were coming to Canada in droves in what, uh, March? <laughs> not really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is, he, he does make that point, Andrew, because he says, you know, well, if we had closed the border earlier, I'm not sure it would have made a difference because it's not like we could have kept the Canadians out. Well, but, okay, two things. We were slow to close the borders compared to some other countries. And vis-a-vis -vis the returning Canadians, we were slow to enforce a 14-day quarantine on them. If you recall, provinces were having to send people out to the airports to tell people you got a quarantine right. for 14 days. And it was basically on the honor system, at least in the early going. So, again, I think there's some lessons to be learned, possibly just hindsight, but possibly should have been known at the time. Althea? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the big failing is probably on the early quarantine aspect and the shutting down the borders. I think the takeaway from the interview is that actually Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump have a pretty decent relationship and the relationship functions. And I think his argument about ensuring that the trade continued to flow is a good one. Um, but we could have taken tougher actions. I mean, you look at New Zealand right now, uh, they're forcing people to go in hotel rooms uh, for those two weeks of mandatory quarantine and charge $3,100 for one adult each room, plus additional fees for every additional adult and child. Um, we were pretty slow. And while we're talking, in the last 14 days, there's been 190 cases of COVID on flights, domestic flights and international flights. There are flights coming in from India, from Europe, from Mexico, from uh, London that are filled with COVID cases. And it's like it has become the norm that you don't even hear about it on the news anymore. Do, do, the fact that, and I, I have to say, Dr. Tam told me this many months ago too, the fact that, they, that, that there was no sort of notion or plan to close the border, d does that seem curious to, to you? Like it, it, like it wasn't even something that could be contemplated, Chantel? Oh, it's easy to say 10 months later, uh, closing sure. the border, uh, no brainer, but that had never happened. We, 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 it wasn't even on anyone's radar. I think she said she couldn't imagine that you could actually close the border. Yeah. For sure, uh, closing airports to people who come from India or Europe, totally possible. But the idea that this border that has been, I mean, go Canadian governments after 9-11 worked awfully hard to make sure that that border remained open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I have, I have a really hard time sitting here 10 months later saying, oh, this should have happened when and people should have known this and that, because I think most of us never even thought that we would live in a country where the border to the U.S. is not open to free travel. Yeah. I mean, that, that is true. And, you know, I mean, obviously the, the questions have to be asked, should be asked, Andrew, but because of the unprecedented nature of what has happened, um, it, it, you know, it is... I don't know. Is, is it fair to ask these? Is it does it make sense to ask the government to have known something that was un, unforeseeable, not as foreseeable as you could have imagined? 
Well, I don't think the issue is the Canada-U.S. border. I think, frankly, that has been a big, big success story, relatively speaking. Yeah. Uh, and that would have been uh, something very hard to contemplate. When we're talking about, though, the border, the external border to the rest of the world, um, other countries did shut down earlier. And I remember when the subject was first broached in Canada, I think it was Health Minister Naidu saying, well, all it will do is just slow down the, the spread of the virus. It won't stop it. And I remember thinking, yeah, well, isn't yeah. slowing it down pretty good idea? Yeah. So I think they were getting some bad advice in the early going. Uh, I don't think that's just hindsight, because as I say, I think other countries, Taiwan, for example, acted very quickly. Uh, Althea. Um, I agree with that. I, I don't think that we're looking back and saying 10, month late, 10 months later, these are the lessons that we should have known. You had liberal MPs at the Health Committee in January, last January, asking Dr. Tam these very questions. Why are we not quarantining these people? And she was telling them, well, asymptomatic people don't spread the disease. And like, you guys don't understand. Like, we, we criticize MPs all the time. But here, these people were actually doing their job. And it seems like all parties on that committee really were interested in like questioning why isn't the federal government taking a tougher stance and that the scientific advice that the prime minister now cites that he was acting upon basically was telling them not to take drastic action and that's what they relied upon okay gotta go thank you all very much uh of course before we go you can be sure to subscribe to at issue the podcast we've got lots of extra content there including the panel's take on this story Part of the plan will continue to put an increased price on pollution through 2030 and return the proceeds back to households. Look for that on any major podcast app and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. You can catch the full interview with the Prime Minister this Sunday on my show, Rosemary Bartner Live. Now, back to Andrew in Toronto. Looking forward to Sunday. Okay, still ahead on The National, what makes Nova Scotia different? Even in the week before we announced the restrictions, people had, to, uh, had really started to modify their behavior on their own. The province's top doctor on why he thinks they've been able to stamp out community COVID spread. Plus. Lights on, music on 10, all the time. I love this story. One man's mission to spread a little, maybe a lot of Christmas cheer. It's our moment. French President Emmanuel Macron is in quarantine, the latest world leader to test positive for COVID-19. <coughs> Macron did make a virtual appearance at a foreign aid conference, but of course he's cancelled all in-person trips for at least the next week. It's believed Macron got infected at last week's European Council meeting. American officials admit a suspected Russian hacking campaign has spread further than first thought. Hackers have been able to monitor emails and other data from several agencies, including the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and the Treasury. They appear to have gotten access through corrupted network software, which has since been repaired. Well, Vladimir Putin held his year-end news conference today, and one big topic of international concern raised was the poisoning of his political rival, Alexei Navalny. We'll let Chris Brown pick up the story from there. The COVID pandemic meant Vladimir Putin answered questions at his big news conference remotely rather than in person. But nothing changed about his contempt for opposition figure Alexei Navalny. Refusing to even utter Navalny's name, Putin instead called him the patient from the Berlin Clinic, where Navalny was airlifted to, as he suggested his poisoning was actually a plot by U.S. intelligence. Several European nations have already determined Navalny was stricken by the banned nerve agent Novichok on a flight over Siberia in August. But this week, a new media investigation used cell phone records and flight logs to make a powerful case that Russian secret police tracked Navalny for years and reported to an FSB leader who had been part of the Novichok program and who ordered hits on the Kremlin's opponents. <laughs> who needs him, said Putin of Navalny, chuckling. If they wanted to poison him, they would have finished the job. The revelations, predictably, have not been given airtime by Russia's government-controlled media. We asked a prominent TV journalist at today's news conference, why not? We don't believe in this investigation because it's really impossible. We, nobody will uh, give him uh, a poison uh, and after that uh, let him uh, out of uh, uh, the country. Outside the Moscow political bubble, when we asked people in the pleasant town of Zvenigorod what they thought of Navalny's poisoning, were uncomfortable. 
you Do you think that it's a uh, right question to ask me about that? I'm not a politician. No, it's just not not good at all. This man told us. But a placated media and lots of public indifference helps explain why Putin can laugh off something as serious as an attempt to eliminate a rival. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. And when we come back, the secret to Nova Scotia's success. People have learned that a part of our culture is we have to rely on each other. How the province managed to beat back community COVID transmission right after this. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine rolls out across the country, we look at vaccine hesitancy and how to have better conversations with people who have questions or fears. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It's been nearly a month since the Atlantic bubble popped, but after some isolated outbreaks, things are back under control and people are able to gather for Christmas. Kayla Hounsel sat down with Nova Scotia's top doctor to learn more about the province's pandemic strategy. This gym is preparing to open after being closed for more than three weeks. We have to do quite a bit because currently our room is set up for six feet between stations. Um, so we're going to have to increase that to 10 feet. Nova Scotia is slightly loosening some restrictions after a crackdown. An explosion of cases had burst the Atlantic bubble. I was anticipating a, you know, a number of days of, you know, 30, 40, 50 cases. But it didn't happen. The case counts quickly dropped. So we sat down with Nova Scotia's top doctor to find out why. So I think a couple of things. The first, he says, is the general attitude of people here. Our economy is being based on really tough industries, fishing, etc., small communities. People have learned that a part of our culture is we have to rely on each other. Even in the week before we announced the restrictions, people had to uh, had really started to modify their behavior on their own. Strang knows his job is easier than his counterparts in bigger provinces, but being smaller also means he has no choice but to act when the virus starts spreading. You see, you know, it seems like a little bit of smoke of a problem and you shut it down. Is that strategic? Well, I think it's a recognition that we would get overwhelmed way faster than in a bigger province. He also points to his relationship with the Premier. It's never been a politicized issue. He seems to do whatever you say. That's what he says, and it looks that way. I just wonder if that's the case, if you always feel listened to. Uh, we have lots of room for uh, behind closed doors and discussions. There's a few, you know, times where we're, we're dis you know, we have different perspectives on things. But they present a united front, and Strang says that makes it easier for others to do their part. We're just trying to do everything we can to kind of follow the rules and keep everyone safe. And although numbers are down and gyms are reopening, restaurants are not. Slow and steady, Strang says, is the key to success. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. And next on The National, a Manitoba man spreads a whole lot of cheer. Lights on, music on 10, all the time. <laughs> of course, what other volume would you have it at? A Christmas parade of one in our moment. Well, Santa Claus parades this year were cancelled, but one Manitoba man decided to make a Christmas float anyway and say, tag with it, I'm having my own parade. <laughs> What's more, his goal is to take a solo parade across Winnipeg, spreading cheer each night until Christmas. And on this night, it's our moment. We weren't able to participate in the Santa Claus parade this year as there was none. We were kind of bummed about not being able to do anything. And one day I was in one of the sheds and I was looking at this, this nativity scene here and I was, kind of the idea popped in my head. I said, well, we're not allowed to see anybody or talk to anybody, but what if I just threw this thing together real quick, real simple, and just go drive around and blast some music into the neighborhoods and maybe people would like that. Christmas on wheels, I suppose, uh, just a little mini Christmas float. Lights on, music on 10 all the time. It's been a ton of fun to, to go out and drive around. The very first red light we actually came to was at Waverly Street. And the very first car that pulled up beside us happened to be a nurse who just came off shift. And she rolled down her window and said, you just made my day. To see people come running out of their houses in their pajamas, absolutely worthwhile. We're doing something right, we're doing some good. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll say. Uh, I'm on board. I'm there. That, that sounds amazing. And here's the funny thing. We would tell you where in Winnipeg you can go see this float, but we don't actually know because he won't tell us. Uh, the, the route is a secret every night uh, because he wants people to be surprised. Although I suspect because they only travel at about 10 kilometers an hour and the music's cranked up to, to 10, as he says, it's probably hard to miss. That's The National for this Thursday, December 17th. Have a great night.